Hey there, wire weavers. Today we're going to be talking about chasing hammer techniques and specifically the planishing technique. This is the planishing face of your hammer. So this is the side we're going to be focusing on today. If you've struggled with paddling wire ends or any of the hammering techniques that I specify in my tutorials, this video is going to help you out a lot with that. So stick around. My name is Wendy and I'm the wire weaver behind door 44. If you'd like to learn to make wire jewelry, this channel is for you. There's a free chasing hammer tip sheet that goes along with this video. If you'd like to download that tip sheet, go to my website, door44studios.com 104. That'll bring you to this page right here, which is the corresponding blog post that goes with this video. To grab your free resource, go to resource library. If you're brand new here and you don't already have a password, click on get a password. Go ahead and fill out this form, click send me the password, and you'll receive your password immediately. If you do have a password, just click on resource library, type in your password, and hit enter. And once you're in the library, you'll find all the files here are listed in chronological order with the most recent file at the top. This one is number 104, how to use the planishing face of your chasing hammer. Just click on that link and your file will download immediately. So the first thing I want to talk about today is using the right tool for the job. Now notice I have three hammers here. Two of these are jewelers chasing hammers. This one is a three ounce hammer. This one is a six ounce hammer. This hammer here is actually a ball peen hammer. This is intended for mechanical purposes. A hundred years ago or so, I was an automated equipment mechanic and this is a hammer I used a lot in that application. I do use this hammer for making jewelry occasionally, but only for very specific applications. I use this when I want to make a really rustic piece and I kind of rely on this texture of this face to help add to that rusticity. And I only use this on very heavy wire gauges. So basically 10 gauge and eight gauge, but for anything 12 gauge and smaller, I use this hammer right here or for very light 20 gauge, 22 gauge, when I start getting into very fine gauges, I'll use this little guy here. I see a lot of wire jewelry makers using ball peen hammers, and this is fine. I don't wanna criticize anybody. I don't wanna suggest that you can't use this hammer to make jewelry because you can, and I certainly do. I don't use it frequently. And the reason why is because one, this tool is very heavy. This is a, I think a 10 or 12 ounce hammer. So it's almost, if not double the weight of this hammer here. And we're working on very fine gauges of wire. We're not working on heavy material. Weight is not a benefit when it comes to working on jewelry. The heavier your hammer, the more trouble you're gonna have controlling that hammer and getting the, the kind of refined finish that you're after. So weight is a factor. The other big factor is this pancake flat face. You'll have no problem flattening your wire with this type of hammer or with a flat face hammer. You will have trouble forming your wire in such a way like paddling the ends, widening those ends out, getting nice round paddles like this. You know, this is something that I did with my chasing hammer and I haven't filed this off yet and I haven't refined it, but look how nice and round and pretty that paddle is. Now look at this paddle here. This paddle was created with this heavy duty hammer. Look how rough that finish is. Can you see how it has sort of a matte finish? There's some nicks in there. You can see some tool marks in there. That all comes from this rough face. So like I say, if you're going for a very rustic aesthetic, this is a good way to achieve it. Find yourself an old rusty mechanics hammer and you can make some some nice rough jewelry rough and rustic but if you want more refined finishes which is what i'm after you're going to get that with a true jeweler's chasing hammer now notice there's some faint tool marks there and that's going to happen because of this rounded surface so actually i used this hammer to make that paddle and this is 16 gauge wire so you can see that this little three ounce hammer will paddle 16 gauge wire with no problem whatsoever. It did create some faint tool marks. If you look at this back surface here, that's the surface that was against my bench block and look how nice and smooth that is. There's no tool marks. It's shiny. This is going to require very little finishing to clean that up and polish it. And I'm just going to have a brilliant shine on that piece there. And that's because look how smooth and shiny that surface is. 
I'm gonna compare these two side by side. You can see the difference. This hammer is designed for heavy mechanical applications. It's not designed to make jewelry. This hammer, on the other hand, is designed specifically for making jewelry. You couldn't use this in a heavy industrial application because it's just not heavy enough or durable enough. But for making jewelry, where we require very little force, this hammer is going to do a beautiful job. The point of this whole discussion is use the right tool for the job. Make sure that you have a nice chasing hammer. If you're struggling to get nice paddles on your wire and you find that this is the, this is the tool that you're using because you found it in your husband's toolbox or in the garage or uh, you picked it up at your local hardware store, understand that using this tool is going to come with a certain degree of frustration. This is something that a seasoned pro can use effectively, but it's difficult for a beginner to get good results with something like this because it's just too heavy duty a tool for what you're trying to achieve. Now, if you want to purchase a true chasing hammer, there are links in the description that are going to take you to this exact same hammer. I bought this hammer off of Amazon and I linked you to the exact same item that I bought. And then you'll know that, you know, what you're using is what I, what I use myself and what I recommend that my beginners use, because you're just going to get so much better results using a hammer like this than you will using something that's designed for an entirely different purpose. And also, if you're interested in purchasing my bench block, this is a two and a half inch square steel bench block with a rubber base. This rubber base helps minimize sound quite a bit. Just look for the shop this video links and you'll find those right there. And of course, those are Amazon associate links. If you do make a purchase, I will get a small commission at no expense to you. So before we get started talking about how to use your hammer, let's talk about the anatomy of your hammer. There are a couple of really important things to note about the jeweler's chasing hammer. And one thing is the shape of this handle. We tend to think of hammers as being pretty primitive tools, but this is actually a very well thought out, well designed and refined tool. You can see this larger curve here and we have this nice thick bulb. And at the top, we have less of a curve. So this bulb is actually designed to fit really comfortably in the palm of your hand. It gives you maximum control of this hammer. Now notice this is your planishing face of the hammer. So that deeper curve is going to always be on the planishing side of the hammer. And what that curve does is it minimizes spring back. I want you to practice something. Go ahead and hold your hammer, just like I showed you, grab the, the thickest part of the bulb and just sort of bounce that hammer in your hand and see what happens. Spring back is something that is used with a lot of hammers like this mechanical hammer or with a carpentry hammer. Notice that this handle is straight. It doesn't have any kind of contour to it. There's nothing fancy about it. It's just a standard oval hammer handle. And the reason that straight design is important is because this hammer is designed to have a lot of spring back. So it's going to make contact with something and bounce right off. And what that does is it amplifies the force. They're intended to drive parts. With a carpentry hammer, you are moving a nail, you're driving that nail into wood. So spring back really helps with that. But when we want to form something, shape something, spring back is less helpful. So in that case, you want more of a dead blow situation. You want the, the hammer to make contact and stay. And what that does is it allows you to make contact and move, make contact and move. So we're going to drag this hammer along in what I call a J stroke. And that of course is a J stroke for me because I'm left-handed. If you're right-handed, it's going to be a backwards J for you. But what we do with that stroke is we make contact with the surface of the wire and then we pull it one way or another. And as we're pulling it, we're causing that wire to spread out. So this handle minimizes that curve there is going to minimize spring back. And you'll notice it if you practice this in your palm, you'll find that this face of the hammer just wants to kind of make contact with your hand and rest there. It doesn't want to just bounce right back off. 
that's exactly what you want in this particular application. Now notice this straighter part of the handle. As you can imagine, we're going to get the opposite effect here. This ball peen end wants to bounce. And in this case, we're not going to do the J stroke. What we want to do is we want to make contact and come off. And we'll talk about texturing in another video. Today I want to focus just on planishing because this is, in my mind, the most important thing to learn. Texturing is quite a bit easier to do than planishing. So that's the, the handle of your chasing hammer, how it works, why it's designed the way it is. And the next thing we want to talk about is the hammer head. Of course, we've already talked about the, the ball peen end. And, you know, that's exactly as you would imagine. It's shaped like a ball. The planishing surface, what makes this unique on this particular hammer is if you look closely, and it's kind of hard to see, but notice that this has a convex domed surface. It's not a flat surface. One way to tell if your chasing hammer has a domed surface is to just rest the head of your hammer right on your bench block. Now notice that gap around the edge there. That tells me that this has a nice domed surface. Now watch what happens when I put my ball peen hammer on my bench block. Notice there's almost no gap. And what little gap that is there, the reason you see that is that's this beveled edge right here. And this is a sharp beveled edge, so it's actually a straight bevel. It's not rounded at all. So there's a sharp corner there, and there's another sharp corner here. And that's one of the reasons you're going to get a lot of tool marks with a hammer like this, because that flat surface, not only does it make it difficult to move your wire and form it like you would form dough with a rolling pin, but it also creates a situation where you're frequently making contact with that sharp beveled edge there. And that's just going to leave deep tool marks. So the rounded face does help minimize tool marks because you're never going to hit the edge of your wire with the edge of your hammer if you're holding it properly and if, you're, if your hand is positioned correctly, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So this, this rounded edge, I just want to emphasize, it's really important. I think it's particularly important for beginners. You can use a flat hammer. Obviously, I've used a flat hammer and I, I showed you the results of that. I was able to get a paddle. It's not as round and as pretty as this one, but that hammer is going to be just a lot more difficult to use. So as you become more experienced, then using a hammer like this is going to be something that you can do in a controlled manner and you can use it to get a specific aesthetic that you're going for. But as a beginner, this hammer is going to be your friend. It's just, it's just designed in such a way and it's weighted in such a way and it's balanced properly this hammer is going to work with you, whereas a hammer like this is going to work against you. So again, make sure that you're using a proper chasing hammer. If you're having trouble at all with your chasing techniques and your planishing and you're just not getting nice paddles and you, you're frustrated and you want to say, Wendy, I don't understand why this isn't working, take a good look at your hammer and make sure that the hammer that you're using is something like this. It's a true chasing hammer with a domed face on the planishing side. We've already talked a bit about grip. I just want to go over that again real quickly. So again, you want to grip your hammer with that. You want to just position that bulb right in the palm of your hand and wrap your fingers around it. That's the correct position for planishing. Now something I see a lot of beginners do is they want to grip their hammer up closer to the head. And I realize that that seems like the intuitive thing to do. It's, it's easy to think, well, I should have more control if I'm closer to the head of the hammer, right? In this case, no. This hammer is designed in such a way that if you hold it properly, you get longer, smoother strokes. So I want you to do a little exercise. Go ahead and grab your hammer at the end of the handle and just do some light air strokes and get a feel for the, how that works, how it feels, how long and smooth those strokes are. Now, go ahead and grip your hammer up at the top 
and do the same thing. And notice how short and choppy your strokes are. And notice also that this handle is bumping your forearm or interfering with your wrist. It's causing you to twist your wrist in an awkward angle. Let's see if I can get that. See, can you see how awkward that is? Now, this is going to create a lot of tension and stress in your arm and your shoulder. So again, by gripping back here, you're, you're working with your hammer instead of working against it. And it's more comfortable to use. It's safer to use. It's not going to cause as much arm fatigue or shoulder fatigue. So again, you know, the tool designers design this handle specifically this way to encourage you to grip it right there. So make sure you're using that grip and get comfortable with it. And once you do, I think you're going to find you're going to get much better results. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is position, hand position. So the best position for your hammer and your arm is you want to go ahead and rest your hammer face on your bench block and you want to position your hand somewhere where the handle of your hammer is roughly parallel with the surface with your work surface. So what this does again is this creates a situation where when you come down on your bench block you're not going to get tool marks because again you're not you're not tipped up you're not tipped back you see how I'm making contact with that edge there when I have my hand too low and when I have my hand too high I'm making contact with the edge this way. So that's what's going to cause the tool marks that you see in that image that I just put up right there. But if you have your hand positioned so that your handle is level when it's in the neutral position and it's just resting on your surface of whatever you're hammering, then as you swing, you're never going to make contact with those edges. You're always going to be making contact with the curved planishing face of your hammer. And that's what's going to cause that nice spreading motion that you want to achieve. Now, the analogy I like to use with these planishing faces, the, the domed planishing face, is this works just like a rolling pin works to move dough. So as you roll a rolling pin across dough, you're forcing that dough to spread in the direction that you want it to go. It's moving away from the curve of the rolling pin. Well, wire's going to respond just like dough to this curved surface, this curved planishing surface. So as you make contact with your wire, it's going to flow away from the apex of that curve. And that's what helps you get that spread and move that wire in various directions so that you can get these nice pretty paddles like this one right here. Notice how round and softly shaped that is as opposed to this one, which is, you know, more narrow. It just, I didn't get the spread there on this one with that mechanical ball peen hammer that I got with my chasing hammer here. So that's it, your hand position and your grip. Those are the two things that you need to keep in mind. If you're getting tool marks, make sure your hand is positioned correctly. And if you're feeling any sort of tension or fatigue in your muscles, make sure that you're gripping properly at the very end of your hammer. Now the next thing we want to talk about is how to gauge your force. This is dead soft 16 gauge wire and I'm going to use my three ounce hammer. And what I like to do is I'll take a piece of the gauge, whatever gauge I'm going to be using, and I just want to make one good stroke, just like that. And then I'm going to look at that and determine, okay, did that start to flatten my wire? So you can see it just started to flatten that piece. So I could use a little bit more force because that didn't give me, you know, much flattening. But what this gauging stroke does is it gives you a feel for how much force you need to use for whatever wire gauge that you're using. Now remember, the lighter the wire gauge, the less force you're going to want to use. If I'm, if you're working on 20 gauge wire, you don't want to hit it as hard as you would 16 gauge wire because it's 20 gauge wire is going to be much easier to flatten. It's going to move much quicker 
and you're going to have less control if you use heavier force. So you want to lighten up your force. You're going to use a, you know, light taps until you figure out exactly how much pressure you need to get that movement that you're after. Let's talk about the J stroke and the, what it'll, it's a drawing stroke and we'll talk about how and why that works. So again, this comes back to that rolling pin analogy. We have this curved face here, and as that curved face makes contact with the wire, it's going to push the wire and spread it away from the apex of that curve. So this is how we move our wire, and that, you know, just, just by virtue of that apex alone, your wire is going to spread. But the way we get it to spread more is we want to make contact and then draw. So I like to call this a J stroke. And it for me, it is a J. I'm just drawing a J with my hammer because I'm left-handed. If you're right-handed, you're gonna be drawing a backwards J. Same concept, <laughs> stick with me. So we're going to make contact and pull, make contact and pull, make contact and pull. And what that does is it draws the wire out into those nice fanned shapes that you're after. So I'm going to reposition my bench block here. I'm going to go ahead and put it on my leg, which is a trick that I use to minimize sound again. And then I'm going to go ahead and paddle a piece of wire for you so you can see exactly how this stroke works. Okay, so if you are an apartment dweller like me, this is a trick that I use again to really minimize the sound. Just by putting this bench block on my leg, it really dampens the sound tremendously. I don't hammer on my workbench because it's a basically a hollow core surface. You can see this white table here. This is an Ikea table. It's hollow core. So doing any sort of hammering on this is like beating on a drum. If you have a solid wood surface, you may not have to do this, but for me, this works really well to minimize sound. So let's take a look at our J stroke. So I'm going to go ahead and paddle the end of this piece. And I just want you to watch the way that I do it. And we'll take a look at the results when I'm done. couple things to notice here. Notice I got a, a kind of a heavy curve there. And part of that is because I've got my camera between my face and my bench block and it's just awkward to see what the heck I'm doing. But again, that also comes from moving the wire and making sure that you're getting everything in the right direction. So Notice that I'm moving my wire around. I'm not moving my hand or my bench block. I'm not, you know, trying to swing my arm around this way. I'm keeping my hammer in the same relative position to my bench block and I'm moving my wire. So if your wire is going in the wrong direction, just flip it around and pull it the other way. Now this one you know, it, we got a little bit of a hockey stick curve going on there, which is not ideal, but notice that I was able to kind of pull it back this way as well. And I could clean that up with a file pretty easily and get that looking more consistent. Now I'm going to go ahead and do one of these off camera so that I could see exactly what I'm doing and I'll show you the difference there. So here's the second paddle that I did. And this one also ended up with a little bit of a curve. I I'm apparently just off on my hammering technique today, but notice that it's quite a bit straighter and more consistent than this other one here. And again, this is something that can be refined easily with my needle file and sanding sticks. Not a bad paddle there. And notice that it's quite a bit wider than, again, this is one that I did with my ball peen hammer. And look at the difference there. You just get so much more spread on the paddles that you do with a chasing hammer. This one was also done with a chasing hammer. If you're really struggling with paddles and you feel like you're 
wire is getting flat but not it's not widening out take a look at your hammer face make sure you have a rounded hammer face if you don't consider investing in a hammer that does have that rounded face because that's going to help you a lot with this technique let's take a look at a curved wire real quick so i went ahead and made just a very simple curve and now let's take a look at what happens when we hammer this piece again i'm going to reposition my bench block and again i'm using my three ounce hammer this is my lighter hammer on 16 gauge wire and we're just gonna begin hammering and I'm gonna move that wire around and I really want to draw out the outer parts of that curve so notice how we got wider parts here and there's even almost a little bit of a flat spot there if you see something like that you can take care of that just put it back on your bench block and hammer it some more to draw that out see how we smoothed out that curve and now this is going to make a nice pretty dimensional curve if I come back in here and trim that tip with my wire cutters and file it off to a point we're going to have a nice dramatic transition there you know you get that nice widened part and tapering down to a very fine point so that's the way you move your wire with the planishing face of your hammer so this is called the planishing technique and again this is probably the technique that is the most difficult to master texturing is quite easy so we'll we'll talk about texturing in another video today I just wanted to get you comfortable with a planishing technique with your grip your hand position and using that J stroke those are the three keys to successfully spreading wire with a with a planishing hammer I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget that there's a free tip sheet that goes along with this video and you can find that on my blog at door44studios.com forward slash 104. Until next time, wire weavers, go make something beautiful. <laughs>